Good morning and good evening, everyone, depending on which part of the world you're in. Um, my name is Paul Grenier. I'm with the Simone Biles Center for Political Philosophy. Um, thank you, all of you, for, for coming. Um, this this uh, seminar by Zoom is co-sponsored by the Simone Biles Center and um, in the Hopkins Nanjing Center in China, of which uh, Adam Webb, who's uh, our co his center is co-hosting this, this webinar with us. Um, I think, Adam, you're not in China at the moment, but your center is in China. I'm in Spain. I, I pop up various places, yeah. Yes, this is uh, well known, um, which is only to be uh, expected uh, for Adam, given your global perspective. And so the, the, the theme of the seminar is, is China and, and modernity, the view from other traditions. And I think it's was. We, we wanted, I think Adam, it was your idea to come up with the idea of the view from other traditions because even though um, you and our co-expert here, uh, Matt Cooper, I say co-expert meaning to exclude myself because I know very, very little about China. Uh, fortunately, two of our associates with the, with the Simone Bell Center, um, which includes both, uh, we're happy to say Adam Webb and, and, and Matt Cooper, um, have studied China as far as I can tell all of their lives and, and, and have really interesting things to say about how China's, some of China's traditions that we find really interesting, even if they're not necessarily the traditions that are currently sort of the reigning ideology in China, but they're going to be talking about traditions that are definitely part of the dialogue, at least in China, which, which I, I find quite interesting and potentially promising. Um, we also have with us, or I'm really glad to see, despite all of the complete craziness going on in the world today, that Anatole Levin from the Quincy Institute uh, was able to join us. And thank you, Anatole, for, for, for making the time for this. It's, it's really appreciated. We're hoping that we'll still be joined by Boris Mezhuev uh, in Moscow, um, the, and, and who's also, I'm happy to say, has is, is, is long been a friend of, of the Simone Val Center. Uh, he had unexpected travel. I don't know what caused the unexpected travel, but again, given the craziness in the world, who knows what is going on these, these days. Um, so with that, I'd like to uh, suggest that in, in a second, I'd like to give the floor to, to Adam. Um, I, I just wanted to add one more point, if I may. Um, originally, we came up with the idea for this seminar actually last fall. Um, and as part of our technology and civilization series, which, of which we had a number of conversations back then. Um, and, and there were obvious political reasons why we have an interest in China. And um, I think it was actually Governor Brown who urged us to have a conversation about China, given its centrality for the problem of, of peace in the world uh, today. Uh, uh, Anatole uh, Levin has pointed out, I think both in conversation as well as in some of your many really interesting written pieces recently, that the events that are taking place uh, with, between Russia and Ukraine today, you know, before the invasion took place, which is given the direction of, of Western policy, was likely to push Russia further into the Chinese sphere of influence and further from the European and Anglo-American sphere. Uh, and this would be down to the benefit of China. And, we, we, it's, and I don't think we can blame China for anything that's happening in uh, the Slavic world right now, as far as I can tell. But they will become the sort of passive recipients of, of an increase potentially in its influence in the world which raises the question of whether Chinese influence in the world is a good or bad thing. And, and you know, our center is not a political center. We don't have a political line. We're not, we're interested in understanding, you know, really sort of the moral meanings of events in the world. And, and what, what is the, what, what is Russia? What is China? And, and, and then making the sort of an assessment of, of, of it from a philosophical point of view. Hence, we're a center for political philosophy. Um, but the, the cliche in the West, in, in the circle of people I talk with uh, about China is that it's this kind of this soulless 
you know, totalitarian technocratic state. And I know enough now from my conversations with Matt and with Adam that that, uh, as, as usually happens, is at least a terrible oversimplification that, that China is many things, just like other countries are. And so we're going to explore some of those types of you know, varieties of Chinese experience, uh, to borrow the, the, uh, the expression. With that, I think I've uh, introduced enough the, the general themes. Um, Adam, why don't you start and then we'll uh, turn to Matt and then I will be able to go to an open conversation. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Paul. Um, so I, I'm going to keep my opening remarks brief because um, I want to make sure we leave plenty of time for what will no doubt be a lively discussion given the range of views both here and um, you know, in the audience from, from questions. Um, and I want to orient us in a way by asking um, three questions and then follow with some observations about China today, because it, it seems to me that a lot of this um, sort of debate about China and modernity um, comes down to what you think the nature of a civilization is and what you're hoping that a civilization will offer to you or offer to, to humanity in general. Um, so th these three questions, the first question um, is what I would call standards versus markets. Um, so is civilization seen as a complex of ideas about human flourishing, about providing a, a standard for human conduct in general, um, or is it seen simply as a marker of group identity? Now, obviously any civilization um, has been associated with some place and people, um, but the logical priority does matter because if you take the content and the standards as primary, then the insights from a civilization are in conversation with people anywhere in the world. But if you take civilization as just another marker of identity and heritage, then that would imply a more siloed view of humanity in which any conversation is mainly about representing oneself. So the first question is standards versus markers, how you see civilization. Uh, second question is um, uncomfortable questions versus stabilizing answers. And from any world historical standpoint, um, civilizations in the sense we usually talk about them really started with what the philosopher Carl Jaspers called the axial age. And that's the period of classical Greece and Rome and the warring states and the rise of Buddhism and so on. Um, and during the axial age, across Eurasia, the emphasis shifted from a kind of tribalistic group membership and custom to essentially human truths that often were in tension with existing society, the call for realizing some kind of ideal in the world. So the second question is, does one see civilization as giving a rich language for asking uncomfortable questions at odds with the social order, or do you see civilization as a source of reassuring answers that affirm a social order more or less as it already exists. Um, so that's the second question, uncomfortable questions versus stabilizing answers. And the third question is um, quite simply society versus state. Um, do you see the center of gravity of civilization in society or do you see it as bound up with a territorial state that claims to represent that civilization and pull together um, all of its dimensions? Um, throughout history, I would argue, um, civilizations have fundamentally been rooted in society. And this can be society of, of different scales, everything from the little platoons that Edmund Burke described up to the sort of grand unity of Christendom or the Islamic Ummah, or even in China, the Confucian scholar gentry held civilization together despite the rise and fall of dynasties and long periods of political um, fragmentation. Um, and of course, in the modern context, we see this you know, Westphalian view of the state as a kind of container around each society. So that in a sense, politics in the modern world is defining or trumping um, civilization. Um, so that's the third question, society versus state. So now I'd come to the, the observations I want to offer. Um, if you take these three different um, questions, standards versus markers, uncomfortable questions versus stabilizing answers, and society versus state, then together they suggest some skepticism about a lot of the prevailing discourse um, today coming out of China. Um, the political scientist Lucian Pai um, once famously made the remark that modern China is a civilization pretending to be a state. 
Um, it actually seems more apt, I would think, to say that the China of 2022 is a state pretending to be a civilization. And the prevailing view today um, in Chinese official discourse is of civilization as identity, as collective representation, and as a legitimizer of social order as it is, not really in the other sense as a source of insights into essentially human truths that demand better of us all regardless of who we are. Now, despite this, I think, depressing reality, I, I do think that there are in fact ample um, civilizational resources centered on China that are truer to the old or axial age spirit of truth and universalism. And I think that those resources can genuinely be part of a common global conversation about these fundamental questions of human flourishing and social order. Um, those resources, however, are simply not the resources that get the most attention um, nowadays. And I'll, I'll mention two examples here. I'm sure Matt will, will mention others later. Um, one example is the um, philosopher uh, Yang Chunling in the 1920s and 1930s. And he was called the, the last Confucian by one of his um, biographers. And um, Yang Chunling saw Chinese civilization as embodying a distinct approach to social harmony and emotional rationality, what he called Yixing. And he contrasted this kind of emotional rationality with both the Faustian individualism of the West, you know, modern industrial civilization and atomism and so on. Um, and he also contrasted it with the world renouncing spirituality of India. But the crucial thing is that even though uh, Yang Shuming saw this kind of Chinese style emotional rationality as deeply embedded in Chinese experience, he still saw it as only one universal answer to a universal set of questions about human psychology and human flourishing. Um, he thought it was an answer that had swollen to prominence in China over quite a long time, given conditions, and um, that China best exemplified. But he also saw that mode of rationality as part of a genuine global conversation in which all three of these answers, the, the Chinese answer, the Western answer, the Indian answer, um, to use the shorthand, but all three of those answers had their own value for humanity at large, depending on the time and the context and the, the needs and the experience of a society. And um, he was not only a philosopher, he also tried to put some of his ideas um, into practice uh, in Shandong in the 1920s and 30s with what he called the rural reconstruction um, movement. And this was centered, I think quite importantly in civil society, not in the state. And this continued essentially until the war and then the revolution um, shut them down. And, and Liang maintained quite a strong critical orientation, even um, he stayed after the revolution and even in the 1950s and beyond after he had this uh, quite well-known uh, row with Mao Zedong over rural policy. And he maintained a certain amount of critical distance from, uh, from the regime. But the other example is uh, more recent and that's um, the uh, philosopher uh, Jiang Qing. And that's, um, he was born in 1953, he's still alive. Um, he's the founder of what he calls political Confucianism. And essentially he's arguing that Confucianism's value is not as just abstract philosophy or as kind of cultural heritage that can be adapted to, to modernity. Instead, he thinks that Confucianism um, really can inform an alternative approach to political uh, legitimacy. And in brief, what he's arguing for is a political model which is quite different from the present regime. And he's arguing for a kind of mixed constitution which recognizes three different sources of legitimacy in parallel, um, which he describes as humans, heaven, and earth, right? So the human source of legitimacy is, you know, democratic elections, a democratically elected um, legislative chamber. But then alongside that, he actually says you should have two other legislative chambers. Um, one would have you know, scholars who are you know, trained in the Confucian tradition and would represent the transcendent insights of Confucian uh, philosophy. And the third chamber would have um, assorted sort of heirs of you know, cultural elites in the past, and that would represent the rootedness of an inherited cultural um, tradition. Now, those are obviously very brief descriptions of both Yang Shiming and, and Zhang Qing, but I think even though what they have to offer is you know, open to you know, contestation and, and debate, I think a crucial point is that none of the, neither of those two see civilization and tradition simply as shoring up the order of the present. Um, they also see the real stuff of life, as you might call it, as largely happening in society or at least informed by truths above the polity of the day. And they have the potential to be universal in their implications. 
Um, now that point about being universal in their implications, I should probably qualify that slightly by acknowledging that both Yang Shuming and, and Zhang Qing may somewhat sell short the universal implications of their writing because um, I've noticed reading them many times, they, they do sometimes slide into a kind of rhetorical tick, which we often see in, in modern China about China being so fundamentally distinct from the rest of the world. And that may occupy a more prominent place in their argument than the content actually um, would require. But even with that disclaimer, they are fundamentally different from the dominant discourse about civilization simply being a kind of Chinese collective identity or, or kind of tribalism. And then my last observation is that um, if you want to try and realize the potential of a genuine Chinese civilizational contribution to the world, right, more along the lines of what Liang Ming was talking about or what Tang Qing is talking about, um, I think it will require a very different sort of intellectual and social space. Um, it would require accepting, for example, that the center of gravity of creativity in any civilization is really in the circuits of society, both small scale and large scale, including across borders. And also that the trajectory of that creativity needs to happen organically, not simply as an exercise in what is sometimes called in China discursive power. Um, it would also require accepting that China is what you might call an inseparable part of the world, that this is not a conversation that can be entirely self-referential. If you're having a conversation about human truths, then it needs to be happening on a universal stage, um, in a sense, more than now. Um, now, obviously, any conversation on a universal stage, you still have the, the perennial issues which are confronting other parts of the world involving, you know, global modernity, liberalism, uh, rights, virtues, tradition, etc. And um, just because you move something onto a universal stage does not mean you necessarily get the right answers, but it does mean that those profound questions at least would play out on an essential human scale and would play out in society and in multiple um, institutional spaces, not simply by invoking a kind of, or misinvoking a kind of uh, tribalistic collective um, identity. So I'll, I'll stop there and um, hand it over to, to Matt to get us started a bit further. All right, thank you, Adam. Um, wow, that Listening to your talk definitely brings back memories of the last time we did this in the uh, Hopkins Nanjing Center in a, in a simpler time. Uh, and uh, listening, listening to you talking about both uh, Liang Shuning and uh, Jiang Qing, definitely. Um, they, they are most certainly still relevant to our uh, conversations today about kind of the, the, the big questions, like the general direction of where, where civilization is going, where society is going, and what the role of society needs to be in an era where, where kind of the fundamental, um, the, the fundamental uh, assumptions of the Westphalian order seem to be falling apart of the cracks. Uh, I, for my own contribution to this conversation, I wanted to sort of really zero in on a single figure here. Um, who like uh, Liang Shuning and uh, Liang Shuning and Jiang Qing is um, pretty pivotal to, uh, I guess, modern Chinese thought, and that that person is uh, the the pioneer Chinese sociologist Fei Xiaotong. I'm going to open up with two quotes here. So, this first one: "Nihilism has become the American way, which is a fatal shock to cultural development." and the American spirit. As a result of this development, the American value system is declining and the entire democratic system is taking a huge hit. Democracy frees man from traditional political coercion, religion, and other dogmas. Man is free, but man has to be able to judge himself. And the decline of the traditional value system of the West will eventually hit democracy. There is no value system in society that can be used as a value system to guide individual decisions, and university education does not provide such a system. This was written by Wang Huning uh, in his much discussed book uh, from 1991, America Against America. The second quote is as follows. In fact, loss of faith in the present social system on the part of the broad masses of the American people did not begin with the energy crisis, 
The spectacular advances in science and technology are good, but the social system remains unchanged. The masses of people are coming increasingly to feel that they have unwittingly fallen into a situation where their fate is controlled by others, like a moth in a spider web, unable to struggle free. Such a feeling is natural in a society like America's. Um, President Carter is right to call this feeling of helplessness a crisis of faith, for it is a doubting of the present culture. Only he should realize that the present crisis has long been in the making and is already deep. And this was, uh, this was written by Fei Xiaotong in his article, America Revisited in 1979. So the highlights of America's systemic cultural crisis, which are present in Wang Kuning's book, uh, America Against America, are part and parcel actually of an entire subgenre of Chinese travel literature and amateur sociology in the tradition of Alexei de Tocqueville. But the specific criticisms he gives voice to with regard to America's rootlessness uh, reductive individualism, lack of personal restraint, whether sexual or economic, lack of links to the past, lack of respect for elders or educators. All of these crit critiques were echoed earlier and with, uh, in my view, greater perspicacity in Fei Xiaotong's earlier series of essays about his travels to America between 1943 and 1979. So who was Fei Xiaotong? Fei Xiaotong was, uh, this is no exaggeration, the father of Chinese sociology. Um, he was a talented young scholar from Jiangsu province who had a deeply Christian, Protestant Christian mother who sent him to the um, boxer indemnity funded Tsinghua University uh, in Beijing to study. And then he became enamored of the methods of sociologists, American sociologist, Robert Park, um, Russian, sociologist and anthropologist Sergei Shirokogorov and uh, Polish sociologist Bronislav Malinowski. And he studied directly under the latter two men. So he was determined to elevate the discipline of sociology to a state of respectability inside China itself, inside Chinese academia. So he began a detailed study on the Yao people who live in Guangxi in Southwestern China. Now, this, this, this study was incredibly ill-fated. Um, it took a tragic turn when his leg got crushed in a tiger trap in a rural area. His young wife, uh, Wang Tonghui, went to get help from a nearby village, but fell into a river and drowned in the attempt. Uh, Fei Xiaotong had to crawl to the nearest village for help, and they sent out search parties who eventually found Wang Tonghui's body basically um, on a riverbank. She'd been dead for days. Uh, he went back to he went back to Beijing. He was heartbroken, and he struggled with depression and suicidal thoughts for the next few years of his life. But working through these, he gained a deeper devotion to his work, and the focus of his work also shifted. So instead of instead of doing kind of the the anthropological thing of um, looking at primitive cultures from the outside, the focus of his work became making the Han Chinese people themselves the primary object of study. And he began to advocate for things like mass education and rural cooperatives uh, from his new post as an anthropology professor in Kunming. So Kunming is, is in the, um, it's also in the Southwest of China. It's, it's not in Guangxi province. I believe it's in Guizhou, but no, Yunnan. I think it's in Yunnan, um, but still in that Southwestern region. And he married again, a young woman named uh, Meng Yin. Um, so in Kunming, he authored some of his more famous works, including Peasant Life in China. Uh, during World War II, he had visiting fellowships at Harvard and Chicago. He made friendships with um, American scholars of China, such as John Fairbank and Robert Redfield, and um, met author Pearl S. Buck, who wrote The Good Earth, and other people. His field notes from his experiences at this time became the basis for his first critical essay on American life and culture. So... After the war ended in 1945, he, um, his criticisms of the reigning nationalist government um, and his connections with the China Democratic League, which I'm going to talk about a little later, got him into some serious trouble. He had to seek refuge at the U.S. consulate in Kunming, 
together with his wife and daughter. And he weathered that time by visiting Great Britain, where he where he kind of got a firsthand look at Clement Attlee's government and admired his progress in implementing a social welfare state. Now, Feixiatong continued to advocate for sociology even after the communists took power, and this also got him into some pretty serious trouble. Although he was initially supportive of the communists, because he was an advocate for the well-being and the dignity of the peasant, he believed um, that the communists would effect positive change for the peasantry from the nationalist uh, government which had come before and which treated the peasants with um, basically contempt. Uh, and he quickly clashed with the new authorities as well. So in the wake of the 100 Flowers campaign, he was labeled as a rightist for his advocacy of sociology as a discipline, uh, which was considered bourgeois. Uh, and he was again attacked as such during the Cultural Revolution. Government suspended his academic appointments. They assigned him to re-education through labor, and he was only rehabilitated with the rise of Deng Xiaoping in 1978. After his rehabilitation, he continued to advocate for um, the sociological discipline in China and sort of um, build it up in its respectability. He didn't really seek to vindicate himself against the people who, who had basically informed on him and sentenced him to RTL. And in fact, his overall academic tone post-rehabilitation um, has been seen as conciliatory to the point of quietism. Uh, from a Western perspective, some Westerners, uh, including Nicholas Kristof uh, at the New York Times, wondered whether he'd actually sold out uh, to the uh, Communist Party of China. Now, though his areas of interest continued to be what they had been, for example, rural, rural advocacy, advocacy for peasant welfare, and advocacy for scholarly exodus and sociological methods, um, There was, there was still kind of this uh, question kind of lingering over his legacy. So the, the place of Fei Xiaotong in Chinese thought, Chinese cultural politics, and Chinese society uh, sort of as follows. So I, I mentioned the China Democratic League before. So this was during a period when China was riven with conflict between the communists and the nationalists, along with you know, Japanese collaborators, warlords, local strongmen, in general, it was it was a state of anarchy largely between the twenty like the nineteen twenties and the nineteen forties, and Fei Xiaotong belonged to a small but principal group of uh, what we call third force activists. Um, some of the names in this group will be familiar. Um, so, for example, Yang Shuming, who was just mentioned by um, Dr. Webb, uh, a Confucian theorist and political activist for rural people. Um, was one of this group. So were the politician Huang Yanpei, rural teacher and education activist Tao Xingzhi, mass education movement founder um, Yan Yangchu, also known by his English name of Jimmy, Jimmy Yan, uh, labor activist, historian, and political martyr Li Gongpu, and modernist poet and fellow political martyr uh, Wen Yiduo. This group of people were Democrats, they believed in um, they believed in the idea that the people should have the final say in, in determining their own destiny, but they were not uncritically advo advocating for the the forms of political democracy that were then prevalent in the West. So, for for example, unlike the philosopher and academic Husher, they were not advocates of capitalism. Um, unlike uh, man of letters and uh, Hong Kong exile, Lin Yutang, they were also not advocates of westernization, even on an intellectual level. And unlike radical novelist um, and uh, political pamphleteer Lu Xun, they didn't see the entirety of the old Chinese culture as being irretrievably rotten, uh, unsalvageable. There were some strong disagreements within this group as to the compatibility of Chinese culture with ideas of representative government, but in general, they tended to view representative government as an overall positive step forward. And in terms of their ideas about mass education, such as so basically saying that all Chinese people deserve at least basic literacy in their own language and rural reconstruction. So things like slow food, local food, um, food sovereignty, credit cooperatives, producer cooperatives, 
town and village enterprises. Um, this group of people, this group of third force theorists has some really interesting similarities with other, with other movements that were going on at the time. So for example, the thought of E.F. Schumacher, uh, economist E.F. Schumacher, very similar in, in their orientation. Uh, the nonpartisan leagues and the farmer labor parties in the upper, upper Midwest of the United States at the time had some very similar um, attitudes and approaches to society and government as this group of people. And um, in Russia, the narodniki, the, the, um, the populists, the advocates of the return to, return to the countryside, um, at this time they would have been, well, I guess a little bit before this time, they would have been associated with the Socialist Revolutionary Party and the theories of economist Alexander Shayanov um, also bears quite a bit of similarity to what Fei Xiaotong was advocating for in China. And the thing is that Fei Xiaotong is, is still highly relevant to Chinese society today. He's still largely considered like the father of the sociological discipline in China. Um, a number of current theorists and um, practitioners of rural advocacy kind of look to him as a, as a lodestone. So people like um, former truck driver and current, um, I believe, Tsinghua professor, Wen Tiejun, who has been working on rural advocacy for the past 20 years or so, um, definitely takes Fei Xiaotong as being kind of a model for his work. Uh, same with uh, Hong Kong activists and academics like um, Lao Qinqi, Sitsui, um, and the, the organization ARENA, which is a rural advocacy group um, that works with, not just with China now, but with um, rural and peasant groups uh, throughout the world, including in um, Africa and um, Latin America, and uh, and I think even a couple of projects in um, Indonesia and Oceania, but I'm, don't quote me on that. Uh, they've also published a they've also published a book uh, in cooperation with uh, Remy Harara uh, called "The Struggle for Food Sovereignty," in which they talk about kind of the continuing relevance of the cooperatives movement for um, the kind of essential human dignity of the of the um the people in the world who produce the most food right um in our conversation about kind of the the um direction of civilization and the and the um this broad kind of open-ended question of are we turning toward a technocracy or are we turning toward a model of something that's more human in scale. Fei Xiaotong is definitely um, still relevant and still kind of a strong, powerful voice on one side of that question. Uh, the, the people who've been following in his footsteps, both inside China and outside China, um, definitely have this um, orientation toward questions of human value that places the dignity of the person as the person currently exists um in the in the penultimate position they're not they're not aiming at you know a merger of man and machine or um the elevation of an algorithm to determine what what human goods ultimately get um priority they're definitely believers in the idea that just because something's old you don't throw it away um we work with local knowledge, we work with local technologies, we work with um, uh, local society to um, improve conditions. Um, this is very much, this is very much like a foundation, foundational assumption that underlies their work. Um, anyway, th so that was kind of Fei Xiaotong in a nutshell and sort of how I view his relevance to the current question. Um, and, yeah, happy to take questions about uh, any of the, any of the things that we've talked about so far. So, I just unmuting myself there. That, that was really, I think, just what we wanted 
uh, as, by way as a conversation starter. A very learned, interesting introductions, uh, both to the idea of what civilization actually is. Uh, Adam, I really appreciated uh, sort of the very broad brush sort of the tools that you gave us to, to, to look at with the um, civilization as a series, as an openness basically to philosophy, a willingness to think to, 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 no matter what, or, or, or civilization as reducing to sort of the formulaic answers which preclude thoughts. Um, and I, I think that, that that's, that's a very useful I think uh, among uh, along with the uh, state versus society versus other um, ang angles, I, I think, um, and, and then and then Matt, that the overview of the founder of, of of Chinese sociology was also super useful. And, and there's I have a lot of questions, but I think I, um, since Anatole is um, is with us. And if you, if you have some questions or thoughts that you'd like to, to jump in with right away, why don't you start? Thank you so much. <clears throat> in 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 this company i i have to speak with great you know reticence and modesty uh, because i i i'm in no way an, an expert on on china though i am very interested so <clears throat> just a few rather disconnected thoughts the first is the very imp uh, interesting point uh, made by adam uh, about the relationship of the chinese state today to the idea of civilization that china you know is is a state pretending to be a civilization or exploiting the notion of civilization uh, for its own purposes, for the purposes of state legitimacy and social stability. Uh, that, of course, um, in many ways echoes not just the critique uh, of Putin and his regime uh, by some Russian conservative uh, and religious intellectuals, this idea that, you know, rather than um, really trying to revive Russian culture as something with, you know, lessons for mankind in general and for how human beings live their lives, that this is really just being exploited for the purposes of Russian nationalism and, you know, to stabilize and legitimize his own regime and under, you know, give a, a perhaps spurious um, uh, air of civilizational contrast uh, to Russia's uh, difficulties or conflicts with the West. And of course, this is, uh, however, uh, in certain respects, not new, because there was a somewhat similar uh, discourse in the 19th century as well in Russia, you know, the feeling that the, the Tsarist regime, you know, was really just exploiting Russian nationalism to keep the population quiet, you know, and to legitimize itself and uh, support political and social order. Uh, without actually sharing in the deeper, you know, cultural and human values of orthodoxy. So um, that I just thought, you know, that that parallel um, with China might be quite interesting. The other thing I I wanted to suggest um, that we might discuss is that uh, well, when when I heard um, Putin speak at the Valdai uh, conference in in October. Um, I was tempted to write a, an, an article based on that, saying um, Putin runs for Republican nomination in 2024, because a lot of it could have come actually from a fairly, you know, crude, I must be, it must be said, Republican candidate uh, in America. Uh, but I think, I mean, what that, uh, on a more serious level, what that um, made me think, and this certainly I, I found reading Wang Huning as well, um, that uh, all over the world, people, thinkers, as well as governments, you know, are wrestling with the consequences of uh, modernization in general, as of course, we've been doing now for almost 200 years, uh, but also more specifically, the, the latest effects of rampant globalization, individualism, materialism, uh, all these things, both in the practical sense of e you know, economic and social policy, but also how, how, to, how to deal with this um, intellectually and culturally. And uh, rather than you know, a, uh, the 
for me, deeply misleading and, and, and also deeply wrong uh, attempt by so many people to, to, to create this new cultural and intellectual Cold War between Western democracy and authoritarianism. And often, by the way, it must be said with, with some fairly strong undertones of racism towards Asia, uh, it would um, be much more useful to think along these lines and to recognize how, uh, you know, when, when it comes to questions about the, the nature and importance of the family, uh, of um, the of social harmony, social uh, solidarity, uh, the nature of a healthy and not hate-based patriotism, for example, you know, that these are common issues that we're wrestling with. Uh, and that in, in certain respects, pe you know, people in, in China and in the West and in Russia uh, are coming up with um, related answers to this. Uh, certainly, I mean, how much one may dislike, uh, you know, many aspects of um, Xi Jinping's rule in China. Um, speaking as a parent, it was hard not to applaud when he attempted to crack down on gaming by teenagers, for example. You know, he could well run for office in the West on that platform, you know, in particular. Uh, so um, I just, yes, wanted to suggest that. But of course, I mean, the, in, in the deeper Chinese tradition, I say this once again with sort of deep hesitancy, but um, the old, old tension, also, of course, deep overlap uh, between the Confucian tradition in China and the legalist tradition, in other words, a tradition which on the one hand focused on moral and cultural values rooted ultimately in education, traditional education, moral education, and the family on the one hand, and on the other, a tradition dedicated to the maintenance of state order through power, through state power and discipline, uh, expressed, of course, not, not in terms of, um, at least ideally not in terms of, um, you know, uh, random uh, dictatorship, but through law, you know. Uh, that is, you know, a, a tension with very, very interesting arguments and lessons on both sides which does, it seems to me, have uh, deep um, interest and meaning for societies all over the world. And of course, in, in, in our own specific form, we see some of this at work uh, in the West today. Um, we, because uh, although they don't see themselves in that light, of course, a, a central theme of Western liberalism now is to use the power of the state expressed through law laws and rules to create a new form of social discipline along the cultural lines desired by themselves. But you, you know, th this, this has behind, is supposed to have behind it the force of the state and of quasi-state institutions like universities, uh, you know, establishing this through um, the rigorous use of legal, you know, legal means. Uh, on the other hand, of course, the cultural tradition in the West, insofar as it still lingers on, is very much focused still on the family and on the, the teaching of moral values through education. So I think, um, you know, that, that there are these very interesting, certainly I found them interesting, points of, of contact, which also in a wider way do help us to push back against what I see as a, you know, this very, very depressing attempt to redivide the, the world along, you know, categorical lines of good and evil and mutual hostility. Um, anyway, that's my own small contribution to the discussion. Thank you. Not, not really small, Anatole. That was, that, that was, that was quite interesting. Um, and I, I, I liked how you brought the conversation about China and connected it with, with the issues that we're all struggling with um, outside of China, which is exactly what we wanted to do, to, to try to look at the Chinese tradition from the view outside of that tradition. So that that was well done. I, 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 you said quite a, a number of things, which I'm sure that Adam and, and Matthew would like to respond to. But I mean, just to throw in one other quick thought, which... Um, Came to mind listening to uh, what uh, Anatole, or I should say, Dr. Levin. I'm going to also add parenthetically that in the comments, um, 
uh, Elias Krim uh, made the helpful uh, suggestion that, that Adam and, and Matt, if you could maybe mention a book or two that the audience might want to look at. Um, why don't you throw that in when, when you respond? But one of the things that, that, that came to mind listening to, to Anatole just now is the is a question that kept coming up when I was reviewing your materials about the um, Jane King and, and Tao Xue Tong. Uh, I'm mispronouncing it awfully. I, I apologize for that. Uh, the, in particular, those, those and some of the other thinkers that you've discussed, um, the themes, themes from uh, Spangler's The Decline of the West kept coming up. And, is, and sometimes explicitly, uh, for example, uh, their a description of the West as a Faustian culture is a, is a typical sort of Spenglerian uh, vocabulary to, to use. Um, that, that raises a, a, a number of questions for me. One, one of them is the one that uh, had the, if there's a culture for Spengler, there, that means there's a concrete idea of the good that that has, that's spiritually animated, that goes beyond the intellectual sphere, although perhaps includes it, which means that that country is focused on its own creativity internally. That that's what culture means, and that's one of the I think most interesting and useful concepts in Spengler, who's otherwise very ambiguous. Um, when the culture is basically dying. It's dead, or it's 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 uh, exhausted itself. That's when you turn to what he calls civilization, where you no longer have that sense of a concrete good, which allows you to create beautiful architecture and temples and um, ha have a loving approach to agriculture and, the, and and have a thriving peasantry and countryside and all these other sort of goods which he sees as being typical of a culture. That wanes, and what you have is an extensive, qu quantitative, externally oriented, often imperial replacement for that, which is focused on Caesarism and technology. And the what you have, um, so that, that's one side of, of what he's saying. Uh, the It's clear that the thinkers you've described, uh, Adam and Matthew, fit, Within a cultural framework, clearly, uh, all, you know, across all of the, the, the strands that I that he just named. If you look at the West today, what he said applies clearly in spades. Uh, that that we're, we're, we're a civilization now, for uh, in, in in those terms, and not a culture. But he also says, which is something that surprised me, that, that the interest in Spengler, that if he he sees China as as his culture as having died hundreds of years ago. And that that it's just imitating exter external civil civilizations at this point. So the so that, that's just a, it, it's interesting. You know, how do they respond to Spengler's critique of, of China itself? Um, and you know, is and what do you what do you see as the the chances? I mean, looking at China's Belt and Road Initiative. And its external orientation, what what's the, its high technology, its uh, modernist architecture, it seems like you, you see the uh, rampant victory of civilization over culture in China. So, I, I, is that explicitly dealt with by any of these thinkers? This this uh, this contrast between these two understandings of, of what China is—is is it a culture or is it civilization? And do they see China as itself is in crisis? I mean, I, I think one point of contact between what you just mentioned and I mean, what I said earlier about Liang Ming is he, he talks about these three different sort of civilizational mentalities or, or modes of rationality. And he does think that that sort of Western you know, Faustian approach of you know, individualism, conquering the material world, sort of satisfying one's you know, desires and ambitions and so on in this, in this way that often you know, produces a kind of disharmonious society. I mean, he, he does see this as sort of gaining ground in China. Now, on, on one level, he thinks that in, in earlier stages, this kind of Confucian uh, temper in China had maybe underestimated the importance of material development. So he doesn't think that it's entirely bad that some of those elements could get more attention, but he thinks fundamentally there is this kind of uh, 
poisoning by technological excess and technological enthusiasm of Chinese society. He's writing this in the 19, 1920s, right, when he describes some of these emerging attitudes among uh, young people in China. I mean, I think the, the broader question here also is, I mean, any civilization, any culture has um, what I think Max Weber called culture-bearing strata, right? But these, these sort of ideas and sensibilities and aspirations, they don't float in a social vacuum, right? I mean, they, they reflect the experience and the, the sensibilities and the sort of psychological priorities of particular um, groups of people. And I mean, fundamentally, despite the fact that there is this kind of discourse of continuity in Chinese culture, right? I think the fact that, that people in positions of influence claim to be the the spiritual heirs of this old Confucian tradition, there is a fundamental discontinuity, right? I mean, the, the, the social strata that are um, in positions of dominance in China, I mean, they do have a fundamental technocratic view of the world, right? I mean, this is not coming out of a kind of, you know, humanistic, literary, scholar gentry um, kind of background. This is coming out of a fundamentally modern experience and set of material um, aspirations. So it's not surprising that material civilization in the sense that, that Paul was just mentioning has become the predominant um, concern. And I think this also would be fundamentally recognizable to you know, Chinese you know, philosophers and educated people from an earlier era. And this uh, fault line or, or relationship between Confucianism and legalism that uh, Anatole was mentioning earlier, I mean, that's a fault line that runs through Chinese history and political culture for many centuries. And I, I think the predominant spirit of modern China would be very recognizable to an old style Confucianism as essentially legalist, as representing a lot of the human tendencies that um, sincere Confucians looked askance at and predicted disaster if they would rise to dominance. I mean, all of this in a sense was foreseeable, the same way that it was foreseeable in the West. The West has done a lot of the things that, um, you know, sincere defenders of tradition 100 years, 200, 500 years ago predicted might happen. Yeah. But I think, Matt, why don't you take a stab at responding to some of those issues that have come up? If, if, you, if you have some thoughts. Well, yeah. Um, So my my general impressions from having lived in China for you know a, probably a total of five years out of the past twelve um, are very much that there are kind of these two um, one of the things that you'd notice very very quickly on living in China and sort of becoming familiar with with some of its um, uh, some of its cultural forms and some of its um, patterns of, of life there is that the, the the distinction between the I, I guess if you want to call it the technocratic the hypermodern the transhumanist idea that okay we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna innovate our way out of the things we're gonna build massive skyscrapers we're going to do um uh massive infrastructure projects um we're going to we're going to surveillance everybody this very much exists and it is a very strong and and palpable presence when you're living there but at the same time it exists alongside and oftentimes in very in in very tight contrast, almost chiaroscuro, with these um, living representation. Well, I don't know they they are living examples of the of kind of the older the older grassroots culture, right? So, um, what they call guti who business or like the family owned business is still very very much a staple of the Chinese economy, and it's not going to be, and it's not going to be otherwise anytime soon. Um, you know, mom and pop shops are the um, bedrock of China's economic growth. The rural family is one of the 
basic bedrocks of China's economic growth. And this is one of the things that Fei Xiaotong was very, very keenly observant about. Um, you'll still see like ancient Chinese temples existing alongside these massive, you know, columns of concrete and glass um, that represent either, you know, concentrated capital or concentrated state power. Um, I think that the best description of this phenomenon comes from another of the another of the people that I mentioned, not Fei Xiaotong, but uh, his colleague, the educator Tao Xingzhi, who compared China to an exposed geological stratum. It, it is it is essentially a fault line. So he compared China to a fault line where you can see exposed all of the layers of sediment going from kind of the, the, the cutting edge of modernity on top all the way to kind of um, deep antiquity on the bottom. And sometimes, unlike in European culture or American culture, sometimes you can see all of these things jumbled together at once. And you can, and even just looking at it is like looking at the exposed stratum. So you've got, um, you've got, you know, 21st century surveillance technology being bolstered by 19th century um, economic ideology, um, which is existing on top of 16th century questions of state sovereignty and um, social patterns that have been going on and technological and family patterns that have been going on for much, much longer than that. And I honestly think that that, um, that, that observation of Tao Ching Zhu's, even though he was saying it something like, you know, 80 years ago, is still very much true today. Um, so in a sense, it's almost apocalyptic in, in, the, in the traditional sense that, that um, an apocalypse is kind of like an unveiling of, a, of, a, of an underlying kind of historical truth or, or an underlying philosophical truth. This question of technocracy or tradition, of you know, seeing like a state or seeing from the grassroots, is very much closer to the surface in China than it is in other places in the world. And I think that they and I think that they kind of have to grapple with this question every day. Um, and that's and I think that this is a big part of Chinese academic culture right now. Including, I mean, not just academic culture, but also things like popular entertainment. So why are why are Li Zixi's videos about you know ideal idealized rural life so popular? Why are time travel dramas so popular in China? So to the point that uh, SARFT basically had to say, uh, no, you're not doing any more of those, right? Why why is it that um, Matt, Matt, Matt? Don't please spell out acronyms. No one else knows them. But but okay, okay sorry. So SARFT is basically the Chinese censorship office in charge of pop culture. Uh, okay. It's the it's the radio, film, and television branch of the, of the censorship machine. Glove lit from the Soviet period. Got it. Basically, yeah. yeah. Um, but like again, like this question of like you know technocracy versus tradition is is like almost the question of Chinese modernity in some ways. Um, Oh, and by the way, yes, I also highly recommend the um, uh, Confucian Constitutional Order by Jiang Qing. It's a, it, is a, it is a highly provocative and um, deeply astute book. And uh, it, I, I read it when, I read it probably three years after it came out, but it, it is definitely, it is definitely kind of one of the more interesting things to come out of Chinese um, intellectual life in the past couple of decades. Well, th thank you, Matt, for having, a, for, not only for that, really those fascinating thoughts right now, but also for putting into the notes for people who are listening in. If you go into the chat, um, uh, there's some um, some of the books that are recommended by our, our I'll call them our lecturers, um, have, have been put there. So take, take a look there and, and take notes. There's some good suggestions there. I just want to throw in two quick, more targeted questions. Um, in response to what I heard from Matthew and from Adam, um, starting with Fei uh, Xiaotong, um, we and, and Matthew, you've 
compared his writings very interestingly with the localism uh, um, and sort of slow food and, and appropriate technology ideas of people like Schumacher in the West, which is, which is very interesting. Um, what I didn't hear, in contrast uh, with John King, um, who Adam um, spoke of in more detail, was any sort of um, grounding in, in, in some sort of uh, metaphysical um, or, or spiritual tradition. And I'm, I'm curious whether his sociologism doesn't sort of um, reduce to sociologism. I mean, does it, does it, does, it, does it, is society self-sufficient from, you know, from, from Confucian or Taoist or any other or Christian tradition? Is, is he basically accepting a kind of Western anthropology and yet having sort of different aesthetic tastes. So that, that was one question. The other one, this one is much more specific still uh, for Adam. And I, I really found Cheng King uh, so compatible with the thinking of Simone Weil and, and her effort to try to pull um, what's, what's the most characteristic in, of, of Simone Weil as a political thinker is that um, she sees faith in the Christian tradition as permeating everything. That, that there's, it's not a private sphere. It's something that, that, that actually is, is um, her, her political thinking, it seems to me, is very, very compatible with this idea of having a, these three chambers of, of rule with, with, with only one of them related to the demos, another related to, to history and, and, and sort of um, and, and was roots in the past, but also and then a third chamber with the with, which is more spiritually oriented. And what I was curious about is, and this is of course the question that would always come up in the West in in response to any of these kinds of ideas is who determines, you know, how do you how how do you get into these uh, three 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 chambers? Of, of political rule, who determines who are the Confucian spiritual uh, leaders, who, who are the representatives of history? How, how does that, is, has that been thought through? So I, I'll just throw those out there. I don't know um, if, if either of you find um, that. What, who, who... I mean, I, I make a, a couple of observations on, on that, I think. I, mean, I think there's a lot of different things intertwined in these, these two questions. Um, I mean, the, the, the issue of you know, what it's grounded on, right? And I, I think that there is a, there's a tendency in some other you know, parts of the world, perhaps to have a certain style of physical, um, philosophical argument where you, you know, lay out you know, assumptions and a chain of logic and, and sort of examine those foundational principles and then build up this whole sort of structure of conclusions from it. And I think that that has developed quite um, thoroughly in some parts of the world, perhaps more than in a Chinese philosophical tradition, which has a different style of argument. So, yeah, I mean, I think that there are some, you know, foundational sensibilities or ideas about the you know, conditions that human beings need in order to flourish and, and cultivate virtue and, and so on, which are, you know, deeply embedded in the kinds of social patterns that Tong and others are, are describing. Um, I think they often may not be made sufficiently explicit, right? Or they may not be articulated in a way which then allows you more readily to um, adapt them to different contexts or to, to figure out how best they can be manifested in different kinds of social um, situations. And I think this is one of the ways in which perhaps bringing this kind of Confucian tradition or these, these observations about Chinese traditional society into dialogue with other traditions actually might um, expand the toolkit even for thinking about the same content, right? And thinking about you know, how do you take the, the kinds of virtues which are valued and, and manifest in the concentric social circles of obligation in traditional Chinese society, and how do you um, maintain what's most valuable in that in you know, a complex, large-scale urban society with mobility and so on. So I think th those kinds of questions about principles and how they manifest under different conditions and you know, hierarchy of what is more and less valuable that you're seeing in these practices, I think that that could be brought to the surface more 
by having this kind of dialogue. Um, the other point I think is that um, these different scales necessarily relate to each other, right? So what individuals need in order to you know, flourish and live a virtuous life, the conditions that will allow them to do that, um, they don't happen in a political or constitutional vacuum, right? And, and how you organize the broader landscape of society and the powers of different kinds of institutions and, uh, and the like, this affects you know, the, the direction of people's aspirations, right? This affects how much space there is um, in society for these different kinds of practices to, uh, to flourish and for these virtues to be manifested. So I, I would argue that you know, any um, tradition, any civilization inherently places truth above power, or just aspires to place truth above power. So any concentration of power inherently subordinates truth in a sense, right? Concentration of power at least tends to work at cross purposes with a sincere consideration of civilizational truth and all the things that it may demand of people in different contexts. So in that sense, there is, I think, a fundamental affinity between the, the truth or the content of civilization and a, a deeper structural or sort of meta-constitutional pluralism in society. So I mean, I think these things are very much um, intertwined. Now, one of the, the advantages that I see in Jiaqing's writing is that he does think that there is something above sort of political power and this mass of, you know, public opinion or, or, or um, the authority of rulers of the day. He does think that there's kind of a transcendental standard of truth above that that should guide this. And he does want to split sovereignty into these different um, streams, each of which have their own logic. That I think is val valuable. I think one of the problems with it is it's still leaving unexamined this problem of a kind of self-contained society in which the state has this very dominant role over society. And I think that actually may work at cross purposes with realizing the full potential of the kinds of things that face our tongue and people in other traditions. Um, that is, I think these different layers, they are intertwined and what you do with the constitutional structure does affect what's manifest in the virtues of daily life as well. This is a fundamental question of, you know, conscience and truth and culture and liberty in a traditional sense too. Yeah, that's, those, those are, that, that those raise such, you know, profound political philosophical questions, Adam, right there. I mean, the, the meaning of power and whether embodied political authority is seen as self-sufficiently authoritative or whether its authority is essentially symbolic um, at some level, I think is that that seems to me the key question. Um, it's, it's the one that um, our colleague uh, and co-founder of the Simon Law Center, uh, Matthew Del Santo, is working on, I think, extremely interestingly in his book on, on Russian Tsarist uh, ideas. Um, from a from a theological and political perspective in in Russia, and, and something that's part of the per, uh, kind of a permanent tension in Russia, is the this is also again this this is an idea uh, that resonates very much with Simone Weil. What I'm trying to say here, uh, and that, that I find in in Math, uh, Matthew Dos Santos' work about uh, the meaning of, of of the Tsar for the Russian the philosophical and theological tradition um, around such, um, well, I won't go into name dropping at, at this point, but the point is, is that the king or the tsar, or including, it, it, this is mentioned explicitly by Simon Weil at one point, should be seen as a symbol um, and not as the final authority, the symbol of the connection between the political order and, and in a natural law or, or something that's beyond the human sphere, which is the real source of authority. And then, and she actually saw the, 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 you know, the English monarch in a sense as, as, as quasi similar to what she's talking about where they don't really have political power, but, but they symbolize the source of power having, having a transcendent kind of uh, dimension to it. So it's not an, but that way you, you can reconcile order with freedom, 
um, because ultimately everyone is accountable to something that transcends the sphere of power, uh, of pure power. And, and that, that's, but that how, how that plays out in reality, you know, is, 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 you know, I obviously connected Adam with what you were saying is that if you have more of a distributed structure of the power system itself, it gives you maybe more, it gives the, the forces of truth within a society uh, more room for, for, for movement, but at the same time, um, none of it works unless it doesn't boil down to a kind of soulless legalism where whatever the state declares is true is true because they have the power to enforce it, which gets back to what, it, what some of the themes Anatole was bringing up earlier. I, I think about how you know, in, in, in the United States, we really do see a kind of a frightening legalism which decides, well, this is true because if it doesn't agree with us, we'll just censor it and you'll never come across this idea anyway. So, I mean, that's that's really not a terribly philosophical approach. Um, while, while we were throwing out ideas about publications, I'll um, egotistically draw attention to my most recent publication, which is on the site of the Simone Weil Center uh, in, our, in Landmarks, um, and where I, I tried to reflect on some of these problems in American culture that I that I just alluded to, and that it, that it didn't. I don't speak about China there, but I talk about uh, Ukraine, Russia, and the end of liberalism is the name of of the paper. Um, and I'd love to get feedback from from our audience about about any of, of of that as well. But I think we we are at the hour and 15 minutes point, which I just similar, which is right around the time we were thinking we might want to wrap up, but I'm in no hurry. I, I'd love to hear any th thoughts from Anatole or anyone else. Uh, uh, actually, Paul, is it okay if I just circle around back to the question that you asked before about face out home and sociology? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, I, again, I, I was I was sort of considering it because I don't want to get into like I, I promise not to get into like inside baseball and gossip over this question specifically, but in the broad strokes, um, starting out, Fei Xiaotong definitely was I would say um, firmly in the in the camp of the sociologist. The the, the uh, sociological thinking needs to be kind of the criterion and basis for our assertion of our ascertaining value, right? So um, in the same tradition as like Weber and Durkheim and of course Malinowski, uh, who was his tutor, um, he definitely started out there. His mom was Christian. Um, his siblings were Christian. Uh, he himself tended to call himself either a, either a, um, general theist or a, or a sympathizer with Christianity, but he never, he never really kind of like joined a, a, um, a body of worship. Um, as time went on in Fei Xiaotong's career, and he started studying peasant life in greater detail and sort of developing kind of a, an inner sympathy with it, I would say that his attitude toward Confucianism, Taoism, and, the, and kind of the, the Chinese grassroots um, knowledge tended to become more sympathetic. So you look at his earlier works, the works from like 1930s, 1940s, they are highly, um, I would say dispassionate. Like they, they do take this kind of very clinical sociological view of Chinese society as, as being kind of like the necessary and a, an authoritative voice on it. As time went on, though, he really ended up becoming much more sympathetic to um, kind of the, the broader moral questions and the broader humane questions. And, in, and specifically, he ended up becoming much more sympathetic to Confucius. Um, I think largely because of his studies of the people that he was working with, the, the Yao people and also the, the Han Chinese people in, in his later career. Um, and, and he kind of ended up, I mean, you read his later works, the works like From the Soil, and it is, it, I mean, his, he has nothing but good things to say about Confucius, 
and his entire attitude toward Chinese society is not one of dispassionate, like clinical dissecting. Like it's we're not we're not saying okay, uh, this is what Chinese society is like, and here's why. It's very much like these are people he knows. These are people whose knowledge he values, right? Um, like so again, it's it's a, it's a complex question, but there is a trajectory there. Yeah. Well, that that's that's helpful, Dick. And I I I I think that I'm in conclusion uh, wanting to say that you know the information that you have shared about these other parts of of the Chinese intellectual cultural tradition about which I knew nothing until you. Uh, uh, until um, Adam and Matthew, you, you taught me about them. I find really encouraging. I mean, it, 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 it shows that, you know, whatever, sometimes we, we project our own faults on other nations very easily. And I think that the, uh, the West's own technocracy is very often projected onto China uh, in ways that are, are really unconscionable. Uh, and it's, it's obvious that there's traditions in China that, they're not only interesting, but it's possible to, to kind of fall in love with them. They're, I mean, they're really human. Uh, the, some of the, I think some of the traditions that you've, that you've introduced us to. Um, so I, it makes me more interested, certainly, in, in trying to continue a dialogue with people in China. This has been kind of a dialogue about China from outside of China. Let's try to figure out a way to, have, to continue this conversation where we we're talking directly with 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 our colleagues, um, and hopefully, God willing, uh, despite the distances uh, around a table, and and that we can tape it and share it with the world. But we'll, we'll see what happens. And uh, any any other, if there's no other closing thoughts, we could maybe wind it up there. Adam, would you like to throw in any? Yeah, I I echo that I echo that point actually, um, Paul. I think it, this obviously has been a kind of a an external you know, uh, consideration from the vantage point of, of other traditions and a kind of a more global perspective on, on this, but I mean, certainly it would be good to have um, you know, a, a differently formatted arrangement where you could actually get some of these you know, thinkers, theorists in China within these traditions to, to engage. And obviously circumstances at the moment are not that advantageous for doing that, but I think people are out there who are definitely worth um, engaging in given the space, I think they would want to do that. Great, great. Well, um, Anatoly Evan, Adam Wagg, Matthew Cooper, you guys have uh, great, you've been great. So all of everything you said was interesting. I think we've had a terrific conversation. I'm going to go um, have a beer or something to celebrate. Thanks. Hope to see you all soon. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Thank you. Bye-bye.